Let's go to the browser. Cool. All right, we are live. So now for the fun part, wait for people to come in. Oh, let me turn off all my stuff that hogs resources. All right. One thing I dislike about Zoom is it loves resources. Whenever I start streaming or recording, it just bogs my system down. So I have to turn off everything else that's going on. Yeah, I see a lot of artifacts. Yeah, it'll catch up here in a second. Everything's almost done. I had, but I had like three Visual Studios open. Uh, <laughs> there was some competition. All right, we got some people going in. We got about 20 people in the room. So if you're out there in Twitch land or uh, YouTube or others, uh, say hi in the chat. We'd love to chat with you. I'm hanging out here today with Jan. <clears throat> and Jan, you have a conference coming up soon, don't you? Uh, I've just been uh, to a conference. I, I'm just back from uh, from Riga. Well, which conference was that? Uh, I've been at uh, oh build stuff. I mean, I've been to DevOps Unicorns in uh, Riga, and to build stuff uh, Lithuania. Oh, which was, awesome! Which was amazing. A lot of famous people and me. So that <laughs> that was. I've had a bit of an imposter syndrome uh, thingy going on there. I, I say the same thing. It's a bunch of famous people and then just me over here in the corner. Yeah. Nothing to see. Yeah, that, that's not uh, fun times. All right. Every, all right. I need my system to catch up. Oh, my goodness. Everything's just taking its sweet time. There we go. All right. We're speeding back up. Cool. Um, let's see. Our... You one of the organizers of um, was it Azure Fest over in the yeah, yeah. there yeah. in the Netherlands? Yeah, because you have organizing. a couple of speakers open right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So everyone who wants to speak in in the Netherlands uh, for for some Azure community event, it's free. So if you want, you can travel to to the Netherlands. But you can also propose a, a nice session, and well, we'll we'll cover the flights and hotel. Uh, but it's fun. We had a great first edition, and the second edition will be more amazing. Two tracks. Uh, we estimate for about ten or twelve speakers, so it's it's gonna be a blast. I've I'm considering it. Um, 
I don't think I have anything else going on that time of year, and I've never been to the Netherlands, so I'd love to visit your country and uh, and see it. 2020 is my year of new conferences that I've never been to before. Uh, I'm not allowing myself to submit anywhere that I've spoken in the past two years. Okay. Uh, so I hope, you, I hope uh, you haven't been to Def Sun, but because we have some calendar clash over there. Okay. So a lot of people are going to Def Sun and can't attend Azure Fest. So uh, uh, I'm we'll, not. We'll see. I didn't. I didn't know they had a call open, so it's it's hard to keep track of all this stuff. There's too yeah. many events. Yeah. Yeah, together with with a couple of friends of me, we have this site called CFP Exchange. So uh, also, okay, I okay. didn't know that was you. And well, it's it's uh, Gerald Verslijs who is uh, is the main uh, well contributor, but uh, I'm helping along with some other friends. And uh, there, that's a page where we submit well papers, and and people can uh, well check them out over there. So if, awesome. if you stumble across some paper. Uh, just uh, put a post over there, and uh, all other speakers know um, know of it also. Gotcha. So, what was that CFP exchange? Yeah, CFP dot exchange. All right. Like the mail server, but n now as a TLD. I will drop that in the 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 chat for everyone who's who's watching right now. Oh, cool. So. That'll certainly help. There we go. Yeah, totally thrilled for Azure Fest. It's it's the first uh, big event I, I'm helping out with. So uh, so that's that's a blast and and a lot of stuff to learn. We're also doing a small meetup, like a Friday afternoon meetup, which mm -hmm. starts in January, and that's because all week is packed with a lot of meetups and stuff and all well have like two two tracks of speakers or two two speaker slots and we thought well let's let's do something else and have a friday afternoon drinks like soda and beers and wine and nice nice appetizers and, and some technical talks and some soft skill talks and some well other type of talks so uh, let's see how this goes it's a uh, january is the first time we're hosting it so we have cool. great expectations because it's different in, you know, in different works, I think. Yeah. It's something new no one's ever done before. Yeah, we hope so. Let's see. I'm looking at uh, CFP Exchange. There's... I need to go through these. Maybe I'll do that while you're talking. I'll, I'll go through and submit a couple <laughs> sessions to, to a bunch of stuff. Let's see. All right, let's... Yeah, I'm also in the program committee of uh, Future Tech uh, 2020, also in the Netherlands. It's in March, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. So just uh, submit some uh, CFPs and I'll do a, do a good word for you. All right. Uh, so folks out in the chat, tell us uh, where you're watching from today. So I'm here in Virginia, uh, in the U.S. Uh, Jan is in the Netherlands, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we we have a couple hours between each other. Our friend Wally is uh, watching on Twitch. He's out in Kansas City. Um, Kansas City Developer Conference. If you've never been out there, that is that is great. A conference. Yeah, I've met. I've met. Uh... Uh, Jim and John at uh, Bill Stuff, and they were telling me about it, and it sounds amazing. Just case yeah. to DC. I love Jeff and John. They, they're, I, I feel like they don't have jobs because they're always going to conferences. Yeah. <laughs> or they have very, uh, very relaxed jobs. Uh, I see more people out there other than just Wally. Where where's everyone following from, or watching from? 
It's okay if it's just Wally. Oh, David is uh, watching from Twitter. Uh, <laughs> that's what he said. He's watching on Periscope, which there's always one person who watches on Periscope, and today it's David. All right. All right, folks. Well, we'll get started here in just a moment. But if you have any questions throughout the, the session, just feel free to put them into the chat. It doesn't matter if you're watching on YouTube or Twitch or Mixer or anything like that. Um, I have a combined chat here on my screen. But if you ask a question, when Jan kind of gets to a logical stopping point or break point or just stops to take a drink of water or a breath, um, I'll break in and ask the question on your behalf. Um, if we don't get to it, don't worry. We'll have time for questions at the end. And yeah, we'll make sure everyone is covered. Uh, friend Fabian Williams uh, from Laurel, Maryland. Uh, I have not talked to Fabian in such a long time. I hope you're doing well, my friend. I love Fabian because he is from the great country of Jamaica. And he has the greatest accent of anyone I know. <laughs> I love talking to Fabian. Fabian also likes to drink. He is a good, good fellow to go drinking with because he's, he's got really good taste. <laughs> And he's also the second person watching on Periscope. I am surprised I have more than one person watching on Periscope. I and that's why people come to his sessions, he says, is because he drinks. Um, so Jan, if you you might bump into Fabian at MVP Summit, he is a sh uh, SharePoint MVP. Um, at least I I think he's still a SharePoint MVP. I'm assuming he's still a SharePoint MVP. Um, but um, they're usually in a, a different part of campus than we are. But every now and then you get to bump into them. Probably at the party. Uh, let's see, we have a question. Did you use Ansible, AWX, or Tower? Um, do you know how it compares to Ansible Semaphore? There's a question for me. I, I think it did. I think it was. Uh, I'm okay. not. Uh, so it's a user blah out there. Um, I have to check out what Ansible is. I've heard of it, but. So blah, maybe hold your question for um, maybe about halfway through the session. And if um, if you still have it, uh, let us know. If not, we'll we'll figure a way how to how to get your question answered. From what I read, it's, um, it's a software provisioning configuration management language thingy. So like ARM templates or Helm charts or stuff like this, I assume. So I haven't used it, so I don't have any opinion on this. So blah, that might answer your question. He does not know how it compares to Ansible Semaphore. Well, let's see, we're at the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and kick things off. Um, thanks for everyone who's been chatting with us so far. Uh, let me see, I'm gonna hit record on this. And all righty, well, welcome everyone to the SwiftKick show. My name's Kevin Griffin. I'm the owner of SwiftKick. We do software training and consulting here in the 
the great state of Virginia in the United States. And today I am joined by Jan DeVries. How are you today, Jan? I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Very good. Well, I am very thankful that you could join us today. I know we've had you in the pipeline for months now, trying to trying to find a schedule that works. And, um, you know, it finally worked out. <clears throat> but you're here with me today. And I uh, we were chatting before the show started that, you know, uh, we're both MVPs, Microsoft MVPs, but we can't really place a time or place where we've met each other. So this might be our first time meeting uh, virtually uh, here here yeah. on the show. And actually conversing. Yeah. yeah. But so we need to make a point at MV the Microsoft MVP Summit in March to, to meet up and meet face to face, get a drink, dinner or something like that. Yeah. So. That's a great idea. Uh, well, Jan, since this is your first time on the show, I always like to ask our guests a couple just icebreaker questions. Uh, first, tell us a little bit about yourself, who do you work for, and what do you say you do there? Well, I, I'm, uh, as you mentioned, I'm uh, Jan de Vries. Uh, I'm a cloud solution architect, uh, a consultant uh, at a small consulting firm uh, called 4.net, based, uh, based in the Netherlands. And what I do over there is, well, uh, consulting so whatever the customer needs uh, I try to deliver so if they need some cloud architect I'll be the cloud architect if they need some developer I'll be the developer just whatever they need uh, of course focusing on Azure uh, I know a bit of what AWS is doing but more high over so my main focus is Azure and I'm trying to do a lot of serverless stuff, create serverless solutions like with Azure Functions, Cosmos DB, uh, the messaging systems uh, like Event Grid, Service Bus, Storage Queues, uh, stuff like this. Um, and of course, uh, doing hybrid solutions uh, any now and then because customers are, well, asking for hybrid solutions and they have a lot of data in some SQL server. It makes sense sometimes. So that, that poses, well, different uh, questions and solutions I have to come up with. So, uh, fun times. And I'm also, well, doing some blogging and, and of course, uh, organizing some small conferences and stuff. So, that's uh, a packed schedule. Oops, I'm muted. <laughs> so, we did talk about some of your conferences um, coming up. So, anyone out there in chat land, um, I dropped a link earlier, but I'll drop a link again. Uh, for some of the things that Jan's working on. If you're interested, if you want to take a trip to the Netherlands, um, there's plenty of opportunity out there. Yeah. Uh, so Jan, um, you mind taking us on a little trip in the Wayback Machine to the beginning of your development career? How'd you get started in software development and how'd you get to where you are today? Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's indeed a long time ago. I'm still quite young, or at least I think so. Uh, I'm 36 years, years old and way back in the 80s, uh, my dad had a farm and he needed some kind of a computer to do his administration. So we got a very expensive computer with two colors, black and green or black and gray. And uh, on it, he had to do his administration. But you, in those times, you also had to do some programming yourself in order to, well, configure the stuff. So he had a big book uh, of uh, QBasic, if I know, GW Basic, and uh, well, he had to learn this stuff, and he bought a lot of books. Uh, so I, I typed all of the words over and pressed compile, I guess. I was like, yay big. So, uh, uh, and then you had a game or some tool with with text and ascii code so that that was fun and i think that's when it clicked to me like this is the stuff i want to do later on so uh, i went to to middle school to, to high school and uh, went to a computer science uh, uh, cs uh, uh, school uh, got the degree and started in some enterprisey uh, company where we had to do well, uh, C++, uh, back in the day, it was like, I think it was 20, 2005 when I started professionally. Uh, and we had to, uh, we were creating apps for Windows Mobile 
2003 and Pocket PC 2002. Uh, and I had to do programming with C++ and ATL. And if we had a chance, we could do MFC, the Microsoft Foundation classes, if I'm remembering correct. Uh, so that was, well, fun isn't the correct word, but interesting. But I, I quickly knew I didn't want to do C++ the rest of my life. Uh, so I moved over to a small in-house uh, company uh, where we did some electronic, uh, well, paper uh, document, uh, well, EPDs, electronic patient uh, file uh, systems. Uh, in .NET, ASP.NET 2.0 was the hot thing back back in the day. So that's what I, when I started with my C Sharp journey. And well, continued along, did some well, ASP.NET. Um, SharePoint development uh, was, well, I did this for a couple of years, which was fun. Uh, and did uh, learn to, to, uh, to develop with Azure I think it was like eight years ago. I should should look it up, but it's eight years ago, something like this. And you had to do stuff with virtual machines and cloud services. And that's when I thought, yeah, this is way better as traditional hosting. So I went full on the Azure, Azure, uh, well, uh, stack. And it, uh, well, moved uh, to a couple of companies uh, again, and now only doing Azure stuff. So that's in in well a uh, quick pace my my story. So uh, basic C plus plus C sharp, and now uh, trying to well find other stuff to learn and do. I uh, I'm not too far away from you. I started with Q basic myself um, in the the early '90s when I was a little kid, and did C plus plus professionally for. Well, learn C++ did it professionally for three months, got fired from that job, or laid off is a better term. They laid off all of us and then went to a job where I started doing .NET. Um, and also at the, the beginning of Azure in the, when it was in beta in 2009. Yeah, I remember they announced it at a professional development conference and and uh, convinced my boss, we have to move all of our hosting there and the rest is history. Um, so that's awesome. Well, last but not least, so let's just put technology aside. Do you have any interesting hobbies outside of tech? Yeah, the, my biggest hobby is uh, is my two kids. Uh, they're trying to get to sleep at this moment. It's eight o'clock now. Uh, so if if they're well very loud, you might hear them scream. So hopefully they'll they'll be silent the rest of the evening. Uh, and aside from my kids, uh, I love to do some photography. I'm a Nikon guy. Uh, so sorry, Canon people and Fuji. Yep. Uh, so, uh, so that, that's fun. I, I like to do this uh, artistic shots, but nowadays it's mostly family shots with the kids. And well, uh, that, that's about most of the hobby. I own my own house. So there's always something to do in a house if you're a house yeah. owner. Um, so that, that's, well, most of my week, kids, photography, and chores in the house. And then you sleep every now and then, and then you work yeah, rest of the time. I, I've and heard it, about this concept, sleeping. I, I should look into it. It's a good hobby to get into. I, <laughs> I recommend it. Okay. All right, Jan. Well, we'll go ahead and turn things over to you. So a reminder to everyone out there watching, uh, if you have any questions at all, drop them in the chat, and I'll relay them to Jan whenever... He takes a breath, um, but Jan, it's all you. I'm going to mute myself and take off video, but you're good to go. Cool. So I'll just share my screen. Yes, you should be able to see something now. So yep, uh, look good. Cool. So uh, as I mentioned, Jan de Vries, you can see my, my Twitter handle over here. So if you have any questions later on, feel free to drop them. Um, so today I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a bit about DevOps and how to take it to the next level because DevOps is something we should be doing for a couple of years now already or if you don't it's probably a good idea to start with it. 
but when you have mastered this and everything is deployed continuously, like every commit is pushed to production all day long, uh, you might uh, stumble across a couple of uh, new issues, uh, which can be uh, solved uh, by doing uh, chat ops, uh, which is something I, I want to talk about uh, today. Um, so, because but first let's let's do a step back and what is DevOps all about? Well, it's about like mentioned shipping code to production, adding value, and do this on a continuous and regular basis. So uh, at, at the previous project I was at, every commit to, to master, as we did trunk-based development, so we only developed on the trunk, the master branch. So every commit was pushed to production, if all tests uh, were green, of course. So that's what DevOps is all about, in, in my opinion, and the of my colleagues. Uh, what it, What's it not about? Well, it's not about lowering the quality of your uh, overall system, uh, getting a lot of phone calls to customer services and well, slow response times if something occurs. If there's a big bug in production or maybe even test, you want to solve it within minutes or at least within an hour or have some root cause uh, within an hour and not wait for days in order to solve something when something happens. That's not what you want when in a, well, uh, a, a stable professional DevOps environment. So we, we probably know, uh, know this, this circle, uh, uh, as, you, as you can see over here, uh, we have the, the planning phase, which is something, well, uh, we know it's, it's like uh, in, in the agile uh, uh, movement, we have this planning uh, with, with the backlog and prioritizing the stuff. Uh, then we do some, some coding in, in the sprints and well, commit to master and, and push it. Well, have a CI build pushing all of the bits, doing all of the tests like the unit tests, but also the integration end-to-end -end and, and uh, uh, UI tests, which are important if you have some front facing thing. Releasing it to, well, whatever environment I use Azure, uh, like app services, uh, but you can also do this on premises or on whatever cloud platform uh, you have. Uh, deploying it and then you have this, this, these last uh, things, these last uh, stages like operate and monitoring. And from my experience, uh, which well, which I saw at a couple of customers, uh, like I mentioned, I'm a consultant. I see a couple of customers uh, per year. Uh, these operations and monitoring stages are well overlooked a lot of the times uh, because we know how to do all of the other stuff automatically. But then we have a couple of people sitting in some, some corner of the office who have to well check the logs, uh, is something failing? reboot systems and stuff like this and maybe do some well interesting stuff with this but it's it's mostly a manual uh manual phase uh, uh in the companies i've i've been at so that's that could use some more automation and some improvement still this the devops stuff is a major improvement from what we had like like 10 years ago because when I started my professional career, uh, we had this, this, this waterfall system of doing projects like the planning phase, two months of writing documents of how, what you should be doing, project initiation documents, requirement documents, um, stuff like this. I was still a junior, so I didn't have to do a lot of this stuff, but I know from, from what I saw from my colleagues, the project managers who, who had, well, bundles and bundles of documents before we even started coding. Then we had to do some coding and the test plans were written and well, it was a mess. Uh, we were, we did projects for two years or something and never delivered anything. Uh, so that, that was like the, the paper age. We did everything upfront and uh, with big documents. And if you found some bugs or want to change something, you had to write enormous papers uh, with request for change documents and bug documents and reproduction scenarios. So that's not today anymore, or at least not the projects I'm involved in.
still will write a lot of documents, but not in this rigorous fashion. Uh, so then we have the, the Middle Ages, uh, which I saw happening uh, about five years ago, or at least five to three years ago. We were starting to send a lot of emails when something happened. Uh, and this is this is a screenshot of my mailbox. Uh, I, I've collected a couple of mails from I don't know how long, uh, but as you can see, thousands of emails for stuff failing or status updates or something someone has to look at. Like uh, uh, you can see uh, Molly over here, which is a payment provider in the Netherlands. Uh, sometimes stuff fails or someone has to look at. Well. We have 170 mails over there. Someone has to check manually. Also builds failing, well, which is normal, but monitoring stuff. Whenever a fatal is, is thrown in production, we get notified. Interesting stuff, but still it's, it's so much email. It, it's a day job for the persons sitting in the operation, well, department, the monitoring department or the, the people uh responsible for this so this takes a lot of time uh most of the, the 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 first four hours of the day they spent analyzing what was in the mails see how to solve it and if it was a false positive or not if it was false positive a new user story or, or a bug was uh, filed and we had to solve it but a lot of work especially if you know one of those emails looks like this this is a daily report we had, and as you as you can probably see, well, we were using Empty Framework, an ORM uh, popular in the .NET space. The, the SQL Server probably was unavailable for some reason. This happens in the cloud, so transient errors happen all the time, and you have to handle this. Still, if it if it occurs too much, we were throwing a fatal, and someone has to look at it. The problem with these types of reports is they are sent daily and I don't care much if my SQL server was failing yesterday because now we're today and it's running fine. So these, these reports were kind of defeating the purpose. They had value and we were del delivering our software slow, but doing continuous deployments, having a new deployment to production every five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. This doesn't make sense because now you also have to check, yeah, did we solve this bug already? So this transient error was solved by Microsoft uh, because, well, uh, they have to fix SQL Azure service when something very bad is happening. But also other errors uh, might happen because some well, uh, fault of the developers. And we want to know this now and not tomorrow when we mess up. There's also this, this new movement or new newish movement of how to work with less email. So people want to have less email uh, in their mailbox, which makes sense if you get hundreds or thousands of emails per day. Uh, it's, it's like time traveling. If you open it up the mailbox at eight o'clock in the morning, it's 1 p.m. before you know it. So that's a major time travel. Uh, so how to get fewer emails? Well, a lot of operations and, and monitoring people and departments say, let's, let's start with monitoring dashboards. And they look like this. It looks awesome. So when you have a customer visit and with those big video walls, you can show them all of these dashboards, which look amazing and impressive. But are they useful? Not in my opinion. Well, they they have value but uh, not the value I'd like to see because now you have to hire people to check out these dashboards all day long and see if something red is blimping on this dashboard. And if it's blimping, press some, well, maybe maybe deep link to, to some error in a system or check in the Azure portal what, what's failing or something. So this kind of defeats the purpose. Sure, we don't get emails anymore or less email, 
but still yet now we have to hire people to watch a well rather static screen all day long because most of the time stuff is ju just running fine so nothing is happening but still if something occurs you want people to be alert and well uh, check out what's happening right away so this is a, a lot of noise and doesn't bring the, the the value to the monitoring people which it which it should still monitoring dashboards have value just not for the operations and monitoring departments in my opinion for the real-time analysis so what should we be doing well uh, we're all rather fond of of uh, teams and slack so let's use this because it's meant for real-time communication. Uh, we can use it on all platforms. Even uh, Linux users can use Teams as of uh, yesterday. So there's no excuse not to use it anymore. Um, I don't care much if you use Teams or Slack. Both are viable options for, for messaging and, and group messaging. Uh, both have ups and downs. I'm a Teams guy, maybe because I'm a Microsofty, but Slack is fine. Also, it, it offers about the same capabilities, especially for this real-time monitoring system, because both of them support webhooks and bots, which I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes. Because what I want to see is something like this. If my service bus or my, my MacQ is filling up with messages, with uh, too much messages, so I'm, I'm noticing uh, messages aren't being handled uh, accordingly. I want to get notified by this. And this can be done, of course, in some monitoring dashboard with some blimpy light like, hey, uh, check me out. Uh, there's a lot of messages over here. Or post a message in Teams or Slack and say, uh, well, there's 100 messages on the queue. Maybe you want to check it out. Uh, it's a security three, so a warning. Uh, this is the resource ID and give some additional context if it's useful. So that's something I'd like to see. Another advantage you have over here is you can add actions to these messages, like fix the stock service bus. I don't know what needs to happen here in this scenario. Maybe rebooting a web job, maybe purging the complete service bus because of some error, maybe post a, a, a support ticket at, at Microsoft, uh, something. But if this happens any now and then, there's probably some default actions you can undertake. And if those don't work, you probably want to do something special, which some well operations person still has to do. So this brings a lot more value and context whenever an error is a curse, in my opinion. So this this one has a, a lot of context, like a lot, uh, there are messages uh, stuck. You can also have uh, some integration with Application Insights. Uh, Azure has uh, this uh, thing called Azure Monitor, and one of the components in Azure Monitor is Application Insights, which uh, checks your overall uh, architecture all day uh, all day long you can also uh, lock meshes to it it also checks the the cpu activity the dtu activity uh, stuff like this for for your resources and whenever something is passing a certain threshold you can post a message to teams and uh, i guess uh, slack also stating some some threshold has been activated some threshold has been deactivated. So my main problem with the default messaging from Application Insights is it provides no context compared to the message we've seen in, in the earlier slides of the stock service bus. We had a lot more context because I created it myself. But these are nice starting points. Like you can see, well, this, this uh, threshold has been triggered and someone can look into it or wait seven minutes and it's already deactivated. This was probably some CPU spike uh, because of reasons, maybe a deployment, uh, maybe something else. No one knows because there's no context information. So where does this, these types of messages fit very well? Well, if you're already 
building an event-driven architecture, this works very well because you're already sending events all over the place, maybe even domain events. So a lot of context is already given uh, in order to uh, create messages and also get context and then aggregate all of these messages. So create an API which uh, has some commands, which spits out events and handles messages. This works very well. If you're inside one big monolith, you can still uh, post messages to Teams. It's just a different way of working. So if you're a cloud native and using Event Grid, Application Insights, Service Bus, App Services, SQL, uh, SQL Azure, and all, all of these Azure Azure native uh, services, it's rather easy to get started with this. If you're on Kubernetes or some on-premises monolith or an Azure, something in Azure as a monolith, you might have to do some uh, stuff by yourself, but it's, it, the concept is, is quite the same. So how would you go about designing such a system? Uh, as I mentioned, we want to have events and these events uh, have to be posted somewhere or these events contain the metadata we need to post to, to Teams. So uh, the, the first thing uh, we started with, uh, we had some, uh, we had a, uh, we had a, a storage queue which, uh, uh, which someone was putting commands on and this, this backend worker, this is a cloud, uh, cloud service worker role uh, were, was handling these messages. And sometimes, any now and then, something failed. So we had some retrying logic in it, uh, retry uh, command for four times. And if the fifth time uh, is failing also, throw a fatal and log it in, in log analytics, log analytics. So this works, but someone had to, well, query the log analytics and see if any fatals had happened. So what we did now, aside from still logging the, the fatal, we also sent a command to, uh, or an event to event grid. So we did some logging and posting an event to event grid, stating something has failed event with some context, what had failed. Uh, in this case, we first used it when the deletion of a SQL Azure database was failing. So uh, we uh, had the capability for customers to delete databases they had created before and then deleting it. So this, this worked most of the time, or at least 99% of the time. Uh, still, if you're deleting a lot or doing a lot of management operations inside a SQL Azure uh, uh, elastic pool, uh, sometimes you do too much at this specific point in time and stuff fails for reasons. It, it's gotten better in, in the, the past uh, year, but uh, for two years ago, it was sometimes a bit flaky. So we sent a message to event grid, uh, an event to event grid, which could be picked up by anyone who was interested in it. So what we did is have a function uh, respond to it, respond to it. So uh, functions were uh, at, at the time, one of the, well, in my opinion, the best solutions uh, to handle event grid events. Uh, at, at this time, you can also hook up storage queues or service bus queues to it. But when we designed the, the system, this wasn't uh, possible. So if you're designing something like this now, please put a storage queue or service bus queue in the middle over here, but you can start out with uh, a function, of course. So this was uh, subscribed to the topic which uh, the, the event was uh, placed at. And this function uh, in its turn placed a message on Teams, which, well, uh, showed uh, the message like the service bus is stuck. This is the context you need. And what do you want to do? Fix it, go to the portal, do whatever. So having a couple of potential actions and well, go to the portal so you can check it out yourself. So that's what we started out with. And this was, well, once we finished designing this and implementing this, this was quite doable. 
And of course, you have some potential action which you want to do, like maybe rebooting a web job or maybe try again deleting the SQL Azure database uh, if necessary. Uh, so we had uh, this this, uh, this web API, uh, which we added an administrator endpoint, um, which we uh, then put a command to a storage queue and uh, some Azure function was picking this picking up this command and try this administrative action, uh, which we want to maybe retry, maybe do some other logic, whatever. You're free to do whatever you want. And if something, if this succeeds or fails, we'll send another event to event grid, of course, stating it has succeeded. So if it failed again, we might want to pick it up again and post a new message to Teams stating this has failed again. So this is the time the operations person is triggered. Hey, I just pressed the potential action, this failed. Maybe I should dive into the Azure portal and check out what's happening over there. If something is failing, maybe status.azure, maybe whatever. Is there some error uh, worldwide, maybe in my subscription? So that's that's still the, the people, the, the person having to think what to do and what to do when something is failing multiple times in a row. So this, this looks rather impressive. Uh, or at least if you're not used to event-driven architectures and working in, in Azure, uh, this, this looks like a lot of lines and services and overcomplicated. And I agree, this looks rather over-engineered and, and very complicated. Uh, but if you're used to it, uh, it's, 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 well, just uh, using event grid and event-based uh, uh, thinking uh, and, and sending commands all over the place. Uh, you could simplify this, of course. Uh, still, using functions has, has my preference, and using Teams also has my preference. Uh, to simplify it, would well maybe the API handle some action and respond to to Teams. It has handled it, so you can skip these two parts. But still, separating those those concerns of receiving a message, receiving a command, and doing a command. Uh, uh, actually executing it is something I like to spread out across multiple services. Uh, also because this administrative action could take a couple of seconds, maybe even minutes, and you don't want to wait for the response of this in Teams, or at least I don't want to. So how does this look in code? Well, let me first uh, uh, show you how this looks in Postman. So I've got uh, I've got the Postman over here. With Postman, you can send uh, messages to some HTTP endpoint uh, and sending data to it. So this is uh, the the fixed uh, failing service bus message. As you can see, I'm I'm specifying well, some message card over here. This is uh, you can find this on the documentation side of of Teams or Office 365, because this also works for Outlook. Uh, but, you can, but you can send this with, with some facts on it, uh, some title images, and some, well, text and the potential actions. So what do you want to do? Fix the, failing, fix the service bus and do, well, whatever's necessary. Or maybe if the deletion of a database is failing, send, delete the database again. Like, let me change this, delete the database, or try to delete the database again, because it might fail, fail again. Try to delete the database again. So, and uh, specify some, some body, some, some data I want to send to my backend system. So this is a, a URL on my API. This is the target of my post, and I'm specifying some data in the body. Uh, which is necessary for my well backend system to do some action. So uh, now I'm interested in the resource ID because with the resource ID, I can look up which resource it is in the Azure portal and the entity. So this was created for 
the service bus, but I can also change it into my database base, and see what happens. Also, I have this uh, this uh, post to well, this shouldn't be a post; it should be a get, but whatever. And I go to the Azure portal, and you can also do a, a deep link over here, of course, in order to for the operations persons to just press the button and go to the actual resource, which is, well, in the error state. Uh, this this button has saved my operation guy uh, a lot of time because first you had to look up every database which we wanted to delete manually in the Azure portal, uh, which, well, is doable, of course, but it takes seconds. And now we could just press the button, go to the resource and be there instead of looking it up or logging in with well uh, checking out where it is uh, stuff like this so now he could just go to there and save seconds or a lot of seconds per day so let's let's send it and if the demo gods have blessed me a bit so i'm having a response of one which means success apparently so i should be seeing a message in my Teams channel now stating I should uh, try to delete the database again or navigate to the resource. So I can press this button uh, and um, the post will be sent to the web API, which I don't have running anymore because I had to clean up my Azure subscription. Um, but then you can again post, uh, post the stuff and well, uh, like I shown you in, in the earlier architecture diagram, do something with it. So this is very powerful and very useful for, for the operations people in order to get more context compared to the, well, the default application inside messages we see. So how to do this? Well, I also got uh, Visual Studio started up and let me zoom in a bit more. So I've got a couple of Azure functions uh, over here. Um, let me zoom in, yeah. So um, I've got a couple of functions uh, like uh, the fix the failing service bus. Maybe the button will, will work. I'll press it later. Uh, so I fix it. Fix the failing service bus. This is the API I've shown you before. Uh, which does something I'll, I'll show you later. And I've got uh, a couple of other functions, which is causing failures, uh, uh, causing events to be sent to event grid. Uh, this is the create failing events and uh, failing events monitor function, which is, well, checking if there are some failing events, picking them up and sending them to my Teams channel. So let's first look to the create failing events. So this, this function will run every five seconds. And whenever a number is dividable by three, uh, it will send a message to event grid. So what I've done is create an event grid output binding. You can find this on Nougat. Uh, and this event grid output binding, uh, all you have to do is specify some end, the endpoint and the, the key so these can be found inside your uh, app settings or in Azure portal settings. And it will send this event to event grid. So that's all there is to it. So if you have, uh, if you can use functions to handle business logic, please do. So you can use this, these powerful output bindings to event grid or whatever system you have uh, in order to well, make it very easy to work with external systems. So no rocket science over here. And in my uh, failing events monitor, I'm subscribing to, well, in this, this uh, case, I'm subscribing to a queue. Uh, and this queue, uh, this storage queue is a subscriber to the event grid topic, uh, which I have uh, referenced over here. So I have this event grid topic. I'm posting events over there, like stuff is failing. And I have a storage queue subscribe, subscription, a subscription to a storage queue. 
uh, this storage queue is, is named failing events. And this failing events queue will have all of the event grid messages uh, inside, uh, which needs to be handled or which I want to show in Teams. So this is the connection string, of course, and this is the message. So I'm deserializing it to the event grid message, getting the data from it, and posting the data in this, this JSON, uh, this message card format, <coughs> and sending it to, well, I've cr also created an uh, uh, HTTP output binding uh, for Azure Functions. Uh, so I've, uh, I'm posting this command to uh, to the to the Teams webhook, which I've configured in Teams. So in Teams, you can configure webhooks to send data to, and this data has to be in the specified format, like we saw in in Postman. So this format has to be sent to the webhook. You can uh, you don't have to specify all of these fields, but at least the text uh, the text field is well rather useful. Also the title, and the rest is just a lot of more context. So I'm using a T4 for this because, well, why not? So uh, uh, as you monitor alert, so with T4, you can specify all of the JSON over here and still have some strong typing inside your code. So you don't have to do some string replacement or uh, some, some, well, some other magic stuff. Uh, and, and this is all I had to do in order to create uh, messages to teams. Uh, the, the fix, the failing event card uh, looks like this. Uh, failure has occurred, failing of an important event because we only want to spam our operations people with important events. Otherwise they will get an exploded channel and still ignore it. So let's run it and see what happens. So the function runtime will, will start up now uh, on this screen. And if we are lucky, control sheet, ah, yeah, found number nine, which is dividable by three. So an event will be thrown uh, on event grid on my custom topic, and it will be picked up by um, the failing events monitor because this message will be picked up by the storage queue. And this function will pick up the message from the storage queue and post it to Teams. So I had Teams open. We have new messages, a failure has occurred. So as you can see, this, this function is spitting out events, like stuff is failing, and uh, and they'll get, they'll, they are picked up. So create failing events is running every five seconds, and stuff is being picked up by the failing events monitor and sending it to Teams. So useful, especially if you only use this for important messages, like stuff someone has to look at right now. So if stuff can wait, you don't want to do this on Teams, uh, or at least not in a real-time fashion. You can just aggregate the events and post it once per day or maybe per hour. So you don't want to overflood this channel. So this is running, please help us. And you can add all the data, all the, all the metadata you want, obviously, because you're still in the Azure context over here and you have some, well, data and you have some privileges uh, of, of being in, in the same subscription. So you can collect more data if necessary for your message and specify this in the message over here. So useful. And let me just stop the, the functions. Uh, so it's been a while since I've pressed the, the fix button. Oh, a lot of stuff has happened. So let me press this button. And if we're lucky, we'll get a response, which I want to show you. So try to delete it. Yeah, it's still working. So what I've done now is I have did a post to my my uh, fix failing service bus function, which is also uh, deployed to the cloud. And what I'm doing over here uh, is 
check out what's in the body. So as we saw in Postman, I'm sending the resource ID and the entity to uh, to my backend. So I'm, I'm getting this data uh, in, in the body and can use this uh, to, well, do the proper command and also respond back to Teams. Because as you can see over here, you can see I have pressed the button, Azure Lurch Jan de Vries. Uh, uh, so people can see, other my colleagues, my coworkers can see I have pressed the button. So if something is failing, they can blame me. Also, as you might notice, the button has disappeared from this message. And you can also see uh, this this updated uh, state of, of the message, which you also see when you're editing a message in Teams, which means this original message has been edited. Yeah, I removed the, the buttons. And this is what you can do uh, in the HTTP response message. So you send out, there's a card update in the body. You specify this to true and specify in the body uh, where I'm doing this, the content, get the content I want to specify in the body. So I have this, this new message card specified over here with the resource ID and entity again, create a whole new blob of JSON and posting this or sending this back in the response message to Teams. This is cool because now my coworker doesn't, can't press the button again. So if your services aren't idempotent, at least they can't mess up by pressing the button twice or three times or four times or how many times. So that's that's useful. Also having a context of the user because Teams is an Office 365 uh, uh, software. Azure also works with an AD tenant and most of the times or a lot of the times they share the same tenant. So they know, or at least the software knows who it is. So what's sent to the back is some some claim uh, with the object ID and with well stuff. And you can also do some authorization over here. So you can check who has pressed the button and is he or she allowed to press the button. So check the person's groups or roles he or she is in, which is very useful. That's what we did in the production scenario. We checked if the user was in the expected tenant, in the expected groups, and had the roles for this application to press the fix button. Very cool. It took some investigation on how to do this. I, I've got some repos on GitHub with, with some information on this, but that's very powerful and also enables you to well, do this in a safe manner because everyone can subscribe to this channel, but you don't want everyone or you might not want to have everyone posting the messages or f pressing the buttons. So useful stuff. So that's, that's the messaging part, T4 templates, uh, of course, strong time. This, you can also find this code on GitHub if you want. It's in my serverless DevOps uh, repository. So if you're interested, uh, check it out. So that's that's the, that's all of the code. So as I mentioned, uh, there are still some problems or some problems if you if you are not careful because you don't want to end up with this just in a different. Uh, different soft software. So what we had is a mailbox full of hundreds of messages with stuff which with status updates and stuff the, the operations people needed to do or the developers needed to do. Uh, but you don't want to have this in Teams or Slack with dozens of channels with hundreds of messages sent throughout a week or a month uh, and no if, if you do this just in a real-time fashion, uh, you'll end up with users not caring or not reading uh, status updates anymore. So like I mentioned, you only want to do this for very important stuff, stuff which has to happen right away. And if, if something can wait, 
maybe aggregate it and have some bigger message sent per day and have some additional data uh, stored in, in the body to fix stuff or to look into it or whatever. Uh, creativity is, is your own. You, you can post whatever you want. Uh, just think before you post it uh, because you want to have people actively engaging with this stuff and not uh, ignoring it. So better messages is one solution, which is something you should do from the start. But also when you have started with this, this well, chat opsy stuff, or at least this, this messaging uh, in, inside Teams or Slack, then you can start with the actual chat ops with bots in, in your Teams or Slack channel. Because like I mentioned, you can add bots to it. And these bots can handle, well, a lot of stuff. So maybe the important stuff, you might not want to have bots for it yet, or at least un until you're comfortable with, with adding bots and the bots doing stuff for you. But when you get comfortable with it, you may, why not? If some operations person is pressing the, the same button all day long, a bot should be able to do this also and maybe not even post a message on, on Teams anymore, but just uh, have the bot press the button right away. And if the bot is failing, then post a message to Teams uh, stating the bot has failed, uh, pressing the button or invoking the action a couple of times and someone, some person actually has to look into it. So start out with, start out simple with posting messages to, to Teams or Slack and making good messages for this. And when you are comfortable with this, create bots to handle those messages again. And it, well, it's, it's just a cycle of improvement. So maybe after bots, there will be some other things you, we can implement, but at the moment, Start with chat messages or with messages in Teams, and then start with bots auto uh, pressing or auto invoking uh, the actions, necessary actions. So that's it for now. Uh, I hope you all will get some value from this, at least the operations people I've worked with and implemented uh, this solution uh, were quite happy with this because it saved them hours per day, uh, hopefully uh, for yours also. Um, and that's about it. Uh, I'll, I'll give Kevin the word. Oh, if, if you want to reach out later on, uh, you can contact me over here, of course. Uh, so thank you all. Back to Kevin. Awesome. I, I really appreciate the analogy to to dashboards um, because you 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 pretty much said what I've been thinking but never wanted to say is that dashboards are really nice and pretty to look at but they're not very helpful <laughs> in, in in the long run so I really appreciate this uh, as an alternative to to dashboards and um, and something else you touched on was you know it's it's nice to know that my SQL server had issues yesterday, but it's fine now. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't matter to me if it works now. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And that's something we stumbled across a lot. So a lot of people were ignoring those status updates. Like, yeah, that was yesterday. Everything is green now. So nothing to worry. Very cool. Uh, so chat, um, if you have any questions for Jan before we turn off for the day. Now's your time. Uh, we got just comments like, oh, this is a great idea. This is cool. Um, but no questions. Uh, <clears throat> well, so I we hope I've everything. inspired a lot of people. I know Wally's inspired. He says, this is a really good idea. Um, Thank you, Wally. So Wally, take this, go, go implement it somewhere. And I want to give a shout out to uh, Rain K Jr. Uh, for the follow. Thanks so much. Um, Master Mind, Master Mandio. I'm not quite sure how to say say his name. Uh, thanks for the follow. Um, 
And thanks to everyone who's just lurking right now. We are, I appreciate you too. Uh, Wally's saying he helped a local food delivery service test something similar to this uh, for their group ordering. And he says they, it worked really well. Cool. Cool. So Wally, was it something like uh, someone starts the order and then it pushes a message to Slack or to teams and says you have 10 minutes to get your order in before the order goes out? Because I could see that being insanely useful in an office. Cool. That's what he says. Exactly. That's indeed very useful. <laughs> All righty. Well, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap things up here. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then it notified when things were ready to go, um, go to the curb to pick it up. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. That's a great use of technology is just laziness. Yeah. <laughs> it's also, like, let's code something to fix this problem. Yeah. Also, implement this with geofencing and when the DHL courier is in the neighborhood, you have to speed home in order to pick up the, the package Yep. Or, or pizza. I love it. Wally, you should come on the show and talk to us about that. Like just talk about it generically. All righty. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. We're almost at the top of the hour. So Jan, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thank and uh, this will live for eternity on YouTube uh, after the fact. Uh, so thanks everyone who watched live on YouTube, watch live on Twitch, on Mixer, on Periscope, all that good stuff. Um, and we will see you all again, uh, probably after the holidays. We're going to take a holiday break. So if uh, whatever you celebrate, happy holidays. And um, folks, we will see you all next time. <laughs>